Stories of Futures Past presents Two Quickies Short Short Vintage Science Fiction Stories by William P. Salton Operation Lorelei and A Trick of the Mind Both by William P. Salton Operation Lorelei by William P. Salton Originally published in Amazing Stories, March 1954 Narrated by Tom Tresen They came like monsters, rather than men, into the vast ruin of what had once been a great city. They walked carefully, side by side, speaking to each other by radio as though they were in deep space rather than upon solid ground. The winding way they followed through the ruins was marked by blurred footsteps in the dust, and the two men, clumsy in their bulky suits, found the going difficult. They stopped, and one of them held out an instrument. He studied the dial. All clear, and both men removed their helmets. They wiped sweat from their faces and glanced at each other. The blond man said, The air's okay, Jarvis. Everything seems all right. I don't get it. Jarvis, his dark eyes wary, scowled as he looked about. It seems all right, but we know it isn't. It can't be. I'm shucking this suit. Don't be a fool, Mark. But the dial read clear, man, and we know nobody is going to shoot us. All life had to be wiped out. How about minor power installations? Jarvis took a chocolate bar from his pocket, sat down on a piece of broken rubble, and began to eat. You're too careless, far too careless, Mark. Mark laughed. You've always been cautious enough for both of us. Got me out of plenty of scrapes back in school, too. Don't think I've forgotten. Affection warmed his blue eyes as they rested on the face of his friend. OK, OK. But what happened to them? Where did they go? Jarvis took nervous bites from his second chocolate bar. Then he, too, peeled off his suit. He sniffed the air distrustfully as he wiggled the shoulders to free them from the clinging damp shirt. Then he took a few experimental steps forward. Seems all right, Mark. But how do you explain about Hank and Garland? Never were two more careful guys. Probably a simple miscalculation. Or an accident. We know it couldn't have been enemy action. Tests prove conclusively that we wiped them out to a man. He took deep gulps of air into his lungs and stretched like a cat. We'll find out soon enough. Boy, I feel great. They deflated and folded their safety suits and added the bundles to the other equipment on their backs. Then, with their instruments held before them, they probed their way into the twisted wreckage, still following the faint dust-filled footprints. Bent and rusted girders rose on all sides like the bones of prehistoric monsters. Nothing stirred. The dust lay ages thick on everything. Gives you the spooks, doesn't it? Jarvis was still tense, poised to respond to the first signal of danger. Feels like we are the last men alive. Funny about Hank and Garland, there's nothing here to harm anyone. Jarvis looked at his watch. Better contact HQ for instructions. The two stepped off the path into the shade of a grotesque chunk of broken masonry. Mark set up the radio and twirled the dials. Team 4 calling HQ. Team 4 reporting. HQ here, the voice from the radio blared loud in the stillness. Give your report, Team 4. Looks like nothing moved here for a thousand years. Safe as a baby's dream. Rock solid. Air morning pure. But... He hesitated, trying not to sound like a scare schoolboy. 
No sign of Team 3, or of Teams 1 and 2 either. Over. Look here, Team 4. It's your job to find out. The Earth didn't just swallow them. Final report from each team placed them well within the city. It's been ten days since the last contact. Probe every inch of the place. Right. But be careful. We can't afford to lose any more men. Roger. Roger. There was only one way now. Ahead. It lay clearly marked. The dim footsteps never strayed or faltered. Three hours of search revealed no pitfalls, no dangers, and no trace of the missing men. The night was upon them, and they bedded down gratefully. Strange, isn't it? The war over. The invaders blasted from the earth. All peril gone. And yet, men disappear. Jarvis stared at the ruins around them. I can't take much more, Mark. Twelve years of war is enough. Are we never to have a life? Have a home and women back? And peace? Sure, it's been tough. But think of the women and children isolated on that sub-satellite. It's tougher for them, just waiting. Stretched on his back, Mark stared at the cloudless evening sky. But pretty soon we'll get this planet cleaned up and bring them in. Christ! Four years without even seeing a woman! I remember the last time. Okay, Jarvis interrupted impatiently. Let's get to sleep. Sure, pal. Good night. They fell asleep to dreams of green hills, corn ripening, apples roasting over an open fire. Peace and home and girls, their firm legs flashing in the sun. Soldier-like, Mark was suddenly awake. He lay without motion, sensitive to some subtle change in the surroundings. From the corner of his eye, he could see Jarvis wrapped in sleep. The silence seemed eternal. Then, whisper soft, came a murmur, a sound, a voice, a girl's voice, sighing and singing from deep in that devastated spot. A woman. Instantly, Mark was on his feet. No need to wake Jarvis. Plenty of time for Jarvis to find out, afterwards. But not yet. A miracle that a girl had survived in all that wreckage, but a miracle he wanted to savour alone. Ahead, the path turned, and Mark followed it as it went forward again, downhill, between the massed walls of rubble. Now the voice swelled, a melancholy song. Well, she won't be melancholy for long, Mark thought. Her solitary ordeal was over. Mark! Jarvis stood on an upturned lintel, ten feet above Mark's head. As Mark jerked to a stop at the cry, Jarvis jumped into his path. You fool! Don't you know it's a trap? So that's how you want to play it? The noble friend, protecting me from myself. He slammed a fist into the side of Jarvis's head. Well, I won't bite. She's mine. I found her. In silence, in the narrow passage between the rocks, the two fought. Suddenly, above the sound of fist on flesh, came the voice of the girl again, clear, young. She is there, thought Jarvis. He could almost taste her lips on his. The sensation came as a shock. How did he know? He'd never had a woman. That's what came from listening to the tales of Marx's exploits with women. Now he had to have that girl. The mounting tension of the fighting snapped something in Jarvis's seething mind. Danger, friendship, duty, all meant nothing. Only one thing mattered. The girl. Mark had had more than his share of girls. He, Jarvis, was the one who should have her. He'd been deprived of his manhood long enough. His frenzied brain hunted a trick to gain his ends. Marx's superior strength began to force Jarvis to give ground. Then a final blow sent him reeling. 
he reached out to break his fall. His hand closed on a rock. He threw it. Mark crashed to the ground, his knee smashed, his leg useless. Then the tomb stillness of the dead city took over. The dust settled slowly. Mark came to his feet. Jarvis was gone. Dragging his useless leg, Mark forced himself to crawl forward. Jarvis had to be stopped. Ahead, a shadow moved, and for a moment the moon threw the silhouette of a man against a cavernous opening in the debris. Jarvis! An electric flash shattered the darkness. The jagged teeth of the bolt spit tongues of fire. Cordite mingled with the raw, nauseant, revolting smell of scorched flesh and hair. The figure tottered and fell into the black mouth of the cave. Then, as the flame faded, it lit up small bundles of charred bones near the fallen body. There was a whir and a click of a mechanism. Fifteen feet away, Mark watched as the arm of a phonograph rose moved slowly back to the starting point. Then the record began once more to grind out its death trap melody. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. A Trick of the Mind by William P. Salton Originally published in Fantastic, January 1958. Narrated by Tom Trussell. Paul Donovan was sitting at a bar when he learned the trick. He had reached out to lift his martini glass when his hand stopped in mid-air, stood rigid, refused to move. Paul stared at it. Sweat broke out on his forehead. Thoughts of paralysis raced through his mind. The hand and arm seemed things apart, and he had a feeling of not possessing them, of complete divorcement from these members. Then he realised his whole body was frozen, and his mind. There was something new about it, something alien. As though it floated above his head, and looked down at him in amusement. Panic flared, then subsided, as he became aware of a strange newness within himself, vague and undefinable this newness, but it was definitely a change, something he had never felt before. Think, he told himself fiercely, there's nothing wrong with you, you aren't drunk, this is only your second martini. Stop this nonsense and pick up that glass. The order was given with every ounce of his brain power behind it. And the order was obeyed, but in a completely illogical manner. His body instantly became lax and docile, but the offending hand dropped to the bar as the martini glass, seemingly of its own volition, moved across the bar, levitated to his lips, tilted, and poured the drink into his mouth. The martini went smoothly down his throat, after which the glass returned to its former position. Paul snatched out a handkerchief and wiped his lips as he glanced guiltily up and down the bar. Had anyone been watching? Apparently not. Then Paul saw a small man with an ingrown chin get shakily off his stool. The little man gulped as he eyed Paul in terror. Then he looked back at his own beer-glass as though it had turned into a cobra. Now he threw down a quarter and headed for the door. Paul grinned. Not interested in questioning or analysing his new power, he was satisfied in being happy with it, in examining its possibilities. He ordered another drink. The barkeep set it before him turned away, and another miracle was performed, as slowly, steadily, the martini glass moved across the polished bar. At the edge it rose evenly in the air. 
The martini glided smoothly down Paul's throat. Empty, the glass returned to the table. Paul tingled all over, thoroughly enjoying the new thrill, the new sense of power. It was far more intoxicating than the martinis themselves. With a marked sense of superiority, he again looked up and down the bar. The first flash of fear gone, he now regarded the other drinkers with patronising contempt. That fat fellow there at the end, for instance, drinking a Manhattan, trying to look like a banker, trying to impress the people. Pompous ass. Maybe I can fix his wagon, Paul thought. The man raised his glass with an exaggerating sweep of his hand. Paul concentrated, and the poor unfortunate poured its entire contents over his immaculate shirt front. The barflies snickered as the man fumbled a bill onto the bar and fled. It worked, Paul gloated. A waiter passed carrying a tray of appetizers. Paul closed his eyes, thought one into his mouth, and tasted the sharp salty flavour of anchovy. This was fun. Next he noticed a glossy dame sitting near the centre of the bar, pushing out her front until it reminded him of twin cannons. So she thought she could scrounge another drink from the guy next to her, huh? Why didn't she just pick his pocket and be done with it? Why not indeed? Effortlessly the man's wallet flew out of his hip pocket and arced down into her low-cut bodice. The girl angled her popping eyes downward. Paul chuckled to himself as she slipped off the stool and headed for the ladies' room. It was all so easy. If he could manipulate his new-found power so cleverly, why not do something truly epic? Like dropping a brick on his boss's head, or, come to think of it, how about putting some money into his own pocket? The cashier at the end of the bar rang up a sale. Then, with the cash drawer still open, his attention was attracted by a waiter. Opportunity! With hardly any effort at all, Paul transferred a ten-dollar bill from the drawer into his shirt pocket. It crackled excitedly as he pressed it flat with a casual hand. Pure excitement swept him. He could do anything! Move into the really spectacular. He could, could even, rob a bank! Thus, when the armoured truck pulled up across the street, his mind was conditioned for its arrival. Through the window he saw the rear door open. Then two armed guards emerged. Bored by the routine, one of them actually yawned as a third guard appeared from the theatre entrance in front of which they were parked. He was carrying a satchel. As he handed it into the truck, Paul's mind worked automatically. Then he watched as the guards vanished inside the truck and closed the door. The truck spouted a white exhaust and pulled away. Paul was trembling now, suddenly aghast at what he had done. This wasn't a parlour game any more, and he told himself it hadn't happened. Told himself this in quick desperation, that this whole thing had been nothing more than an idle daydream, a moment's relaxation along with a few drinks. Like hell it was! Regardless of how he figured it, he was now a big-time thief. Big time? How much is big time? How much money was now stuffed in the briefcase beside his stool? He reached down surreptitiously and hefted the bag for weight. Plenty! He ordered another drink, and gave it no chance to play tricks, snatching the glass firmly by the stem and lifting it the old-fashioned way. It didn't help much. Then real panic welled up as a heavy hand dropped on his shoulder, and he turned and saw the goggle eyes of a little fat man, saw the pudgy finger pointed accusingly. I tell you, officers, this is the guy, and his nuts, stark raving nuts, I'm telling you, he gets his drinks without even lifting them. They bounce right off the bar. There were two policemen, a rather bored oldster with signs of breakfast on the front of his uniform, and a spruced-up young patrolman not yet disillusioned. 
The older cop dropped his hand from Paul's shoulder and spoke with a certain deference. "'This is no charge, mister. Just a routine look-in. Our friend here is all excited about something and, well, you know how it is.' "'That's okay, officer,' Paul croaked, striving to control his voice. The younger cop, taking a cue from his superior's manner, threw a stern look at the discomfited fat man. "'Do you want to prefer any charges, mister?' The fat man took an involuntary backward step, banged his heel against Paul's briefcase, and instantly both policemen were staring at the floor. Paul's eyes followed theirs. A chill went deep into his bones. That faulty catch! He'd meant to get it fixed. Now it was his undoing as a heap of banded banknotes spilled out on the floor. The elder cop broke the silence. Maybe there'll be some charges, maybe not. But I think we'll take a walk to the station all the same. Paul clawed at his mind for a retort. Any law against carrying money? he asked, trying to make it sound light. No law against it, no. But you've got to admit, this is pretty unusual. Do you think I stole this money? The officer tipped his cap back and scratched his ear reflectively. No. "'But I've got a hunch it doesn't belong to you. "'I don't think you got any right sitting here in this bar with it. "'I think maybe you got a boss somewhere that might have sent you out to a bank or something, "'and it could be real nervous wondering why you don't get back. "'We'll just take a little walk to the station and no offence to anybody, OK? "'Paul's mind was numb as he stood between the officers at the call-box. He could not force his brain to function even normally, let alone execute any mental tricks discovered in the bottom of a martini glass. A squad car pulled up, and he climbed docilely in the back seat, and sat like a man in a trance between the two silent policemen. At the station there was the added chill of feeling like a man alone, a criminal involved in a terrible experience that was merely routine to the tormentors who walked by his side. It was one of the older stations, with a well-worn floor marked by the scuffing footsteps of many an unhappy wrongdoer. The desk sergeant had a sagging, disillusioned face, and a pair of eyes that had given up all hope of utopia. He turned them on Paul and grunted, "'What's the gripe?' The senior officer did the talking. "'We don't exactly know, sergeant, but we've got a lead on this character.' found him sitting in a gin mill with enough dough in his catch to pay off the national debt. It seemed a little out of line somehow. The desk sergeant stretched his scrawny neck and peered down at the offending briefcase. The dough in there. Right. Let's have a look. The younger officer lifted the bag as though it contained the secret to every unsolved crime on the books and deposited it triumphantly on the desk. Pity battered leather to lug around real dough in, the sergeant commented. He lifted the flap and reached inside. Then he scowled at the accusing cop and tipped the briefcase upside down. A sheaf of white papers fell out, a pack of new lead pencils Paul had lifted from the supply shelf that afternoon, and a copy of Lurid Sex he had bought at the corner newsstand. That was all. The desk sergeant slammed the briefcase down on the desk and glowered at the trio before him. "'What kind of a rib is this? You jerks think I got nothing more to do than sit here and let you bounce your gags off me? Besides, this isn't even a gag. It's got no point. Let's have the snapper. I'm listening.' The elder cop turned pale with amazement. The younger one, obviously of different metabolism, had turned beat red. After a thick pause, they found their voices simultaneously. "'I swear on the Bible that there was money in that damned briefcase when we first looked into it.' Paul passed up the bus, preferring to walk the ten blocks to his apartment. He needed the air, and the sense of freedom was glorious. Thank heaven his mind had come unstuck that last moment, and now the sheaf of money was back where it belonged, 
in the satchel of the armoured car guard, humbled, completely chastened, and not a little scared, Paul hoped he had caused no one any inconvenience. And strong indeed were his resolutions. No more mental transference. In fact, no more martinis. From now on, he would get his money the hard way. In the end, that would turn out to be by far the easiest. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. A new story every single day.